solemn introvert. Even if he was just standing, you would see him, you would just stand. You would see he's, he's somewhere else. When you're in prison, you say, okay, when we get out, these bastards, we're going to deal with them. Zimbabwe became the diplomatic hub of the region all because of meaningful sentiments that the president exhibited then. The continent has seen a succession of elder statesmen who led their countries to independence and managed them wisely. The oldest African to lead a nation is Zimbabwe's president Robert Mugabe. At his 91st birthday party, Robert Mugabe was keen to show off his energy and general good health. He also saw an opportunity to score political points by talking about how much more money from the safari business in Zimbabwe should go to locals. Most of the safari, very few are African. The majority are white. Safari, safari. Safari. But we are now going to invade these forests. Mugabe has been a political actor for more than four decades. But before that, he was a dedicated student who gobbled up knowledge from as many sources as he could. This thirst for education certainly came from his mother, a teacher. Robert Mugabe was born in 1924, just months after his country had become a British crown colony and was named Southern Rhodesia. His religious parents named him Robert Gabriel Mugabe. In the Bible, the angel Gabriel is the messenger who imparts God's wisdom to many prophets. His father, a carpenter, disappeared when he was young, leaving the family after the death of one of Robert's brothers. But his mother worked hard to make sure he got a good education, sending him to a Catholic school. Many times I have had the privilege to talk to him, just the two of us. We have done that for many years. He also felt that the mother was doing everything. She was looking after them. And there he was, the father's gone. So, and being the bigger boy, yes. Who else is the friend to the mother but him? Church schools have been respected for giving young Africans thorough teaching for decades. Young Robert Mugabe was identified as a clever lad by his teachers. I mixed with other boys. I played tennis ball with others, you know, so on. Went to school with other boys and so not, not quite a lot. But I, I could leave alone with one or two books of mine. Father O'Hay, an Irish priest and the headmaster at his Jesuit high school, became a father figure who encouraged his young charge to go into teaching. This priest father O'Hay was a, an inspiration to him. One, in English. Robin Mugabe speaks English better than some of the British people. And he learned it from father O'Hay. 
swimming. He said, he is the priest who taught us swimming. Mugabe did become a teacher, but not before attending Fort Hare University in South Africa. He concentrated on history and English and earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in 1951. He then returned home to teach. But his education would continue. He started taking long-distance correspondence courses with the University of South Africa. He soon had a Bachelor of Administration diploma and, more importantly, by 1953, a Bachelor of Education degree. In 1955, he started teaching at Chalimbana Teachers Training College in Zambia, then called Northern Rhodesia. Mugabe decided that his own education would be improved by moving his correspondence courses to the University of London. He is a very, very widely read person. Because of that uh, scholarship, uh, it has enabled him to be able to understand and analyze things at a much deeper level. 34-year-old Robert's next teaching post in 1958 would be in Ghana. Here he would be greatly influenced by Kwame Nkrumah, whose country would be the first under colonial rule to reach independence. Mugabe declared himself a Marxist while in Ghana. He learned quite a lot from them. Uh, you will hear him talking about uh, quoting uh, Kwame Nkrumah, for example. And uh, for one of his quotes is that uh, you don't sacrifice uh, principle of the altar of experience. In 1960, Robert Mugabe decided to visit home and introduce his Ghanaian fiance to his family. He was shocked at how things had changed in southern Rhodesia. A new colonial government had brought in thousands of white settlers. They displaced black families who were now coming to Harare in search of a means to survive. Mugabe was outraged. We are non-racialist in our approach. That is, we regard as an, an individual as an indivi individual and that uh, everybody must be accorded his full political rights, whether he be white or black, educated or uneducated, rich or poor. And this is exactly why we are at the moment struggling to earn for our people one man, one vote. The situation provoked the most significant change in his life, from teaching to politics. He started addressing protest crowds. Mugabe praised the Marxist stance of Ghana's leaders for bringing independence. I was impressed by his... Um, uh, 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 articulation of issues is a very articulate uh, person. He, I mean, he mentioned in English, and uh, he was very good. He, I was also impressed by his knowledge of the history of uh, 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 of Ghana, how Ghana got its independence, and the role of Kwame Nkrumah, and so. After only a few weeks back home, he was elected public secretary of the National Democratic Party. It was uh, a torrid time for us, uh, blacks. Uh, we were discriminated uh, in public places. We wouldn't walk the streets of Harare without being harassed. Uh, and when we went to school, particularly uh, at boarding schools. These were segregated uh, institutions. In 1963, Mugabe helped found a resistance movement that would pledge to use any means, including violence, to achieve independence. It was called the Zimbabwe African National Union, ZANU. And this declaration landed Mugabe in jail at the hands of the colonial government for a decade. 
when I was uh, in detention, uh, uh, in prison, I worked as a receptionist clerk, just receiving people, giving them uh, their clothes, whatever they they needed, they do a living, give them their uh, and, uh, normal uh, clothes. So I got to know him very well. And uh, I must admit I was most impressed. When you're in prison, you say, okay, when we get out these uh, bastards, we're going to deal with them. His young son died while he was in prison. But he was not allowed leave. I want to know why the white people imprisoned my son, Robert. He spent 11 years in prison. One, two. When his son died in Ghana, they refused him to go and bury his, his son. And she said to, he, he said to me, Mom, please let us, these white people, let me go to Ghana. I don't even need a escort. I will go to Ghana and bury my son, and I'll come back. I will not run away. While in prison, Mugabe stayed busy. Using secret communications, he helped coordinate guerrilla operations. And despite being incarcerated by representatives of the British government, he continued his schooling from the University of London. Ironically, he earned two law degrees while behind bars. We had read in the newspapers uh, that the, the whites felt that Robert Mugabe uh, is the, the, the uh, most radical nationalist. So I got in touch with uh, he, he came in, we stayed together and we spent a lot of time because he was in detention, uh, he was not a prisoner so he didn't get, go to work. I spent a lot of time with him uh, trying to find out what kind of a person he was. Solid. Yes. Introvert. One you could, even if he was just standing, you would see him, you would just stand. And we see he's, he's somewhere else. He's not where the body is. He's somewhere else. And, uh, and then, but he's conscious of people around. But you would see he, he he was planning all the time. And he struck me as someone civil, decent, educated. You could tell by the kind of behavior, the way he carried himself among other people. Shyish. But you could tell. Uh, there was no sign of him being a bully person or pompous, or arrogant, and above all, after being 11 years in prison, uh, being bitter. Once upon a time, Prime Minister, you said you would never see black cruel in this country in your lifetime. Do you still stand by that? Yes, I believe that uh, it was a fair comment, and I think that if we ever got to a stage of having black rule, then I think our policy would have failed. It is for you, the people. In 1974, Ian Smith, the southern Rhodesian colonial governor, dramatically reversed his position and decided to consider a transition to majority rule. He decided to let Robert Mugabe go to a conference across the border in Lusaka. Mugabe feared he was being used by Smith's government to stall a transfer of power until far into the future. With a white nun's help, Mugabe escaped. Crossing back over to his own country, he joined guerrilla forces. We thought what's important 
was to mobilize people. But we didn't have the knowledge, the technique of mobilizing people. So we had to engage the Chinese. The Chinese came to our help, to our help and they uh, taught us what to do. Uh, we sent some of our fighters to China uh, to train to, militarily as well as politically. And by 1971-72, we had trained enough cadres uh, to uh, mobilize uh, people for armed struggle. He spent most of the next five years leading the bloody conflict with Smith's security forces from newly independent Mozambique, where he received support from the independence hero, Samora Michelle. We wrote to the front line, they say Samora, Michelle, Nyerere, Kaunda. Oh, of course, Kaunda didn't like us anyway. But uh, anyway, uh, finally Robert Mukabe was accepted. And uh, so when we were released from prison, we were asked who our leader was. And we said, yeah, Robert Mugabe is our leader. And the Nyerere, Samora said, are you people sure? Can't uh, leadership evolve from, uh, from the fighters? Oh, no, 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 Robert Mugabe is our man. Uh, there was no real uh, base within the country for them to operate. We hadn't actually prepared the people for the armed struggle. In waging a struggle, we are not only liberating ourselves physically, but we are also liberating the oppressed, the whites who are oppressing us. And uh, to that extent, our movement got a lot of support international. People understood that ZANU was fighting uh, the system of oppression, secularism, imperialism, and not fighting whites as whites. In 1979, Ian Smith allowed elections that would result in a black government. The country was renamed Zimbabwe. But those involved in fighting with the government, including Mugabe's ZANU-PF party, were left out. The guerrillas, who had now added patriotic front to their name, kept up the fight. This evening, Lord Carrington pretended that all had been well, pretended that there had been progress, as far as the Patriotic Front is concerned, there have not been discussions at all with anybody in respect of the substantive matters regarding the ceasefire. And we insist that there can never be any agreement. This is just rubbish, absolute rubbish. Nobody will take cognizance of it. The international community did not recognize the new government. Eventually, a new internationally supervised election was held and Robert Mugabe's ZANU-PF was victorious. He was named the new country's first prime minister. And he felt that he had the wisdom, education and experience to bring success to a new nation. Fantastic. We observed and watched the British flag being pulled down and our flag being hoisted. Uh, it was marvelous, really. After those thousands who died, the bombs, and but at the end of the day, we say, well, these are bygones, and why should we look back? Let's look ahead. 
and we train our souls. That's my speech, the speech I made in March 1980. Turn our souls into plowshares and become friends. This was an optimistic time in Zimbabwe. Every man got a right to decide his own destiny. Famed reggae musician Bob Marley came out to play a concert to celebrate this enormous achievement. So harm in arms, with arms, we'll fight this little struggle, children. That's the only way we can overcome a little trouble. And brother, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. With African nationalism apparent everywhere one went, whites were preparing to leave for South Africa. The South African apartheid regime had its military clear a path for them at the border. He had seen what his friend Samora Michel went through with a mass exodus of educated Portuguese leaving in 1975. 200,000 whites were living in Zimbabwe many managing important infrastructure like electricity and public transportation. There were also 6,000 white farmers owning and growing on 47% of the land. Mugabe decided to act. In his independent speech, he said, the wrongs of the past must now stand forgiven and forgotten. It could never be a correct justification that because whites oppressed us yesterday when they had power, the blacks must oppress them today because they have power. Many Europeans left anyway. And there was an uneasy relationship between the whites and Mugabe for decades to come. But the country was able to feed itself. The economy grew at about 11.5% over the next decade. Mugabe invested in areas close to his heart as both education and healthcare spending tripled. It is not surprising that his first wife, Sally Heffron, was a teacher. They met at the Takoradi Teacher Training College while Robert was in Ghana. We just became friends. Then uh, I got to know the background. Good parentage and they'd been brought up well. She was a teacher. And the first time he brought her to his home, he got swept up in the new politics of the day. This actually sat well with Sally, who came from a political family. You, you would realize that in Sally Mugabe, it was in here. Uh, there was no pretense, there was no stage management, it was not acting or performance, it was in here. She was an activist, even more radical than, than, than her husband. They soon got married and had a son a few years later. But his son passed away while he was in prison from cerebral malaria in Ghana, where Sally had moved to be close to her family. But Sally would be Mugabe's closest friend and most trusted advisor for 30 years. She was a very, very close friend of mine. You could not compare her with anyone in that position. She held it with lots of dignity. Well, she was a wonderful person uh, and uh, very loving.
When she passed away in 1992, the whole country mourned. And many saw a change in the country's leadership, not for the better. Before Sally's death, Robert had started an extramarital affair with his secretary, Grace, who was also married to an Air Force pilot at the time. After Sally was gone, yes. Well, it was necessary for, for me to look for someone. And uh, even, even as Sally was told, you know, going through the last few days, although it, it, it uh, might have appeared to some as cruel, I say to myself, well, it's not just myself needing children. In 1996, they tied the knot in an extravagant ceremony many in Africa called the wedding of the century. He is a modern husband uh, because actually he's not fussy about anything. I do what I feel like doing and uh, we know at home with my kids rather than be in the political field. They have since had three children and Grace Mugabe has risen to head the ZANU-PF Women's League. It meant that we were no longer, you know, an aunt, especially the, an aunt who is uh, the wife to the head of the family, uh, becomes the mother figure for all of us. So it's therefore meant that we then had another mother figure. Uh, we then had somebody the way we could go to and, uh, you know, uh, cry and talk about all of our problems, talk about all of our aspirations and all of our wishes. Many think she has Mugabe's ear as a political advisor without having the education or experience that Sally brought to her husband. They are light years apart. Sally was a stateswoman. She is not. A lot has been said pertaining to Grace Mugabe, especially how she is now the power behind uh, Robert Mugabe, but this is not correct. But uh, maybe what we can attribute to Grace is that she has radicalized ZANU-PF's way of doing things, and because there is some powers behind her in form of her husband, nothing can stop her. Yes, I remember some of his lyrics in this place. 